Shaheen Misri is the CEO of Teach for India, the nationwide movement that aims to end education inequity in this country. Over the past three years, Teach for India has placed over 500 fellows in schools across Mumbai, Pune, and Delhi. 200 Teach for India alumni are now impacting the movement's mission from within and outside education. Ms. Shaheen Misri is also the founder of the Akansha Foundation, a non profit organization with a mission to impact the lives of less privileged children and enabling them to maximize their potential and change their lives. <coughs> Over the past 20 years, the foundation has expanded from 15 children in one center to over 4,000 children across its after-school centers and nine schools in Mumbai and Pune. Ms. Shaheen Misti is also an Ashok Fellow, a global leader for tomorrow at the World Economic Forum, and Asia Society 21 leader, and serves on the boards of Umeed, the Thermic Social In Initiators Foundation, and is also an advisor to the Latika Ray Foundation. She also serves as a committee member of the National Council for Teacher Education, and was also one of the six privileged Indian delegates to the Presidential Summit on Entrepreneurship held in Washington, D.C. in 2010. Ms. Shaheen Misri has also taken upon herself to bridge India's educational disparity. Aimed with her strong convictions and love for kids, she challenged herself to state the state of children's education. Ma'am, we salute you for your undying efforts and thank you for accepting to address the Ayam community. Ma'am, the stage is now yours. Who I want to be through my life. And so 
if you're interested in, in introspecting a little bit more about yourselves and where you are, we're going to be doing that later. Do, you have, do, you need, do I need the mic? Yes. 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 yes.
everything we could have possibly imagined, materially, emotionally. I had everything that, that I could have possibly wanted. And I wanted to see a slightly different side of India, which I had not grown up seeing at all. And so I walked into one of um, Mumbai's huge urban slum communities. And on that day, I happened to have a camera. And this is actually the first child that I ever met. So she remains really, really important in my journey. Her name's Pinky, and a couple of years after I met her, I lost touch with her, and I don't know where she is. But if you just look at her eyes, to me, the eyes of the children that I saw represented such immense possibility. I would walk in the community, and I'd look at these bright, sparkling eyes, and I would say, oh my god, if this child had the same opportunity that I had growing up, where could this child be? And how many Sachin Tendulkars, how many athletes competing at the Olympics, how many Einsteins are there in this community whose potential will never be realized? And so right at that stage, it was less about education that I felt passionate about and more about equity. This, this lack of understanding as to why was I born where I was with the opportunity that I had, and why was she born where she was? And the only really honest answer I came to over years of thinking about this question is I actually did nothing to deserve being born where I was. It was a flip of a coin. I got lucky. I had opportunity. A whole lot of other children got unlucky and they didn't have opportunity. And so that drove me to start a, a very small college project when I was 18 called Akanksha, whose goal didn't even have anything to do with education when we started. But our goal was actually the line from a Ziggy Marley song that I liked at the time. Um, and it was to give a little love, have a little hope, make this world a little better. Can we just do that? Simple. Give a little love, have a little hope, make this world a little better. So we started out, and I want you to remember this child, because she's going to come back in a few minutes. But she was one of my first students, and her name is Parveen. And she was three and a half. And I don't know if you can tell how naughty she was, but she, she even in this photograph to me, she looks naughty. But she drove us crazy, because none of us knew how to teach. We'd never been teachers. We would sit together on Sundays. We were all 18 years old in college. And we'd say, OK, what did you like when you were in college, when school? And what activity did you like? And what book did you enjoy reading? And we'd pull together this curriculum just based on things that we really liked. And we'd start doing them with a small group of children in the community. We recruited 15 kids. We literally started. We were all volunteers for the first five years. Just to give you an idea of how basic it all was, so you can see that anything is possible when you start. <coughs> Until there were 300 kids in the program, we didn't even have money to print t-shirts. So we would hand paint the Akamsha on the t-shirts. Um, the idea behind the foundation was very, very simple. When I came back to college in India, I was really shocked at how few people actually attended classes at St. Xavier's College where I was. Everyone would sit in the canteen and have curry rice and chai. And then a month before everyone's exams, everyone would actually go out and buy their textbooks a month before the exams and then sit for the exams. And I would look at that and I would think, on the one hand, we have these huge social problems in India. And on the other hand, we have the brightest people in the world sitting in this canteen. Why can't we marry the two? Surely these people care about these problems. Maybe all we need to do is create a platform to bring them together. So the original vision of Akamsha was just <coughs> can we take people who really, really, really want to be educated, the kids, and the unbelievable minds and hearts of these incredible children in our country, can we take people who have time to teach, because they're sitting in the canteen anyway, not doing much else. Can we take available spaces? So even in a place like Bombay that appears so crowded, what happens to all those classrooms after 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock? They're all empty. So can we utilize all these available resources and just bring them together? That was my idea. Very, very simple. A few things, well, many things, 
but, but just one that I'll share, deeply and profoundly shaped my lifelong commitment to this work. And this was one of them. This was a little girl called Gitanjali. And she was six years old and she was in my class. And her best friend was another girl in my class called Barki. And then one day, one of the mothers of these girls set fire to the mother of the other girl, 12 o'clock in the afternoon in front of everybody. This woman sustained 80% burns, died a few days later. So within a span of a week, these two best friends, one had lost her mother, and the second one had a mother who had a life, a, a, a life term in prison. And I looked at that and I said, how is this possible? How can these things happen? How can kids live through this kind of trauma and still believe that the world is a good place? And it gave me a lot of insight into how hard the work ahead was going to be in really combating the huge disadvantages that so many of our children in this country, and I'm sure many of you in this room as well, have gone through. How do we combat that? How do we give people not just a little bit of literacy, but the kind of education, the kind of love, the kind of support to really reverse those kinds of odds? And this is really how we started. I mean, this is an actual shot of our first attendance register. And you can see very few peers. The kids wouldn't come. They were all absent. We'd have to go house to house, often give them a bath, get them ready, pull them out of class to bring them to class. That was our curriculum. It's evolved night and day today from where it actually was when we started. But it was something. And I remember the first five years, we were all volunteers. And you know how it is with volunteers. When volunteers want to come, they come. When they don't want to come, they don't come, because there's a movie or someone's birthday. Or And I remember volunteers coming to me at the end of the day saying, crying, saying, but you told us we were going to make a difference. We're not making a difference. This work is just too hard. It's too hard to be a great teacher. It's too hard to reverse these odds. But the kids kept coming back, and that kept giving us hope. And then I went abroad again, and I did a master's. I decided to actually study education, come back with a little bit more knowledge. My best friend managed Akansha while I was away. She hand wrote letters to me every day. And this is an excerpt from one of them, which was a big achievement. I was so thrilled when I got this. There are more than 32 kids in school every day. Most of them come out on their own, but some still need to be pulled out. So these were like the small steps of success. Um, and that's, I hope, just, just giving you a little bit of pic a picture of how we started. Why did the kids come to school? Um, not to study. They came because at that time, the community that we worked in had no running water at all. And the, the particular school we got space in had huge basins this big with running water. So the first thing the kids would do is they'd run into the school, jump into the basins fully, like their feet and everything in the basins, put the taps on, and come soaking back to class. They would actually take this clay plaster scene, they'd throw it on the ceiling, they'd make sure the Didi who they didn't like too much was standing underneath, and they'd all be making bets on the side as to whose head would this fall on. Um, so the kids just came to have a space, to have fun. And along the way, we were able to invest them and ourselves in the power of education and what it could actually do in a sustainable way to turn around their lives. And then what happened? Jump to 2004, we became more and more convinced that the vision had to be around maximizing kids' potential. Right? And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. But when you think about what it took for you in your own lives to be sitting where you are. How many experiences, how many people, how many different platforms, your networks, each other, the support that you got, the people that believed in you. We said, like, how do we provide all that for our children at our Kamsha? And we did it through two different ways. We started 60 what we call our Kamsha centers which were saying that from the age of three, 
till the kids graduate <coughs> from high school and go to college, can we create this after school space where the kids know <coughs> that they can come every single day no matter what? So no matter what goes wrong in their life, they're going to come to this space and they're going to get an excellent English education because that was one of the things that the community was demanding the most in terms of them getting a job. A really solid foundation in math lots of exposure to values and the mindsets that would make them successful, and just exposure in general, like bringing in the arts and music and all of these different elements into their lives. And then 10 years into running the Akanksha Centers, we said, why can't we actually be running schools in partnership with the government? At the end of the day, it doesn't make sense that we're running a center, the kids are in a failing government school, they're getting conflicting messages everywhere. Can we actually show the government that with the same kids, with the same money, and with the same infrastructure, we can actually achieve dramatically different results? And so today, Akanksha actually partners with the government to run full-fledged schools for the poorest kids, attempting to really, what we call at, at Teach Brindia and Akanksha, <coughs> taking kids from one life track and putting them onto a fundamentally different life track, one where their potential is maximized and they can really do whatever they want going forward. <coughs> do you remember her name? Mm -hmm. So then Parvi grew up, 17 years into my work, she grew up, and that's Parvi on the right again, um, and she was part of an Akanksha program called Learning to Lead, and then incredible things started happening in Parvi's life. She got into Elphinstone College, and then she transferred to Sapphire College, so two really well-known colleges in Mumbai. She graduated. She was from a very conservative Muslim family. Family wanted to get her married. She found a fiancé, but she insisted both with him and convinced her family that he would have to wait for four years to marry her until she was done with her education. She's actually now, while she was in college, because of her proficiency in English, she got a job at the same time, earning 15,000 rupees while she was in college. So she managed to put aside that money and put down a down payment on a home. So for the first time in generations, her family is actually going to move out of the slum into a home of their own. And so I saw this kind of change, and I didn't just see it with Parveen. I saw it with Jyoti, who is now joining Xavier's this year. I saw it with Samina, who's now working at Teach for India in our HR department. I mean, all these incredible changes, both academically, but even more importantly, socially. Right? So kids who were able to stand up, who had had incidents of sexual abuse happening in their family or in their community for years, and who now had the conviction and strength to stand up and say, you know what, I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to solve this problem. Or you know, young girls whose elder sisters were married at 13 and 14, who now had the strength to say, I'm going to wait till I'm 23, 24, 25 to be able to get married. And when this kind of change happened, I felt two very conflicting emotions at the same time. The first was a great deal of pride that I had been a small part of so many people working together to really put these kids in a different place in their own lives. And it was just incredible. I mean, today all the Akamsha kids are my Facebook friends, and I'm seeing like all the unbelievable things happening in their lives, and they're traveling abroad, and I mean, they're doing all kinds of things that at least I didn't expect when I started at 18. But the other conflicting emotion was just a huge sense of failure, feeling like it's been 17 years of doing this work, and we're still touching 4,000 kids. And when you look at the 320 million kids in India, and you know that it's possible, not just because you've seen a statistic, but you've actually seen Parveen grow and change, you feel an overwhelming responsibility to try to do whatever you can to provide those kind of opportunities for the 320 million kids in our, in our country who actually need it. Um, and so I felt I had sort of gone back to zero. And I was like, 17 years, I'm older now, I don't have as much energy, but I really believe that we can solve this. Like, this is a solvable problem, and this is our nation's biggest 
biggest problem because if you look at education, it's directly tied to every other important indicator that people need to turn around their lives. So I began to ask myself a really difficult question. How do you get to all children? How do you do this? How do you give kids the kind of opportunities? And education isn't like franchising a McDonald's, which in and of itself is difficult, right? But it's a long process. It's an in-depth process. How do you do that at scale? And when I answered that question to myself, I said, actually, the problem is we don't need like 100 Akanshas to solve this problem. We need a new generation of leaders to solve this problem. Because today, across all our sectors, whether you look at a politician or a businessman or an educator, our leaders today, with many exceptions, but overall, our leaders are not deeply committed to solving the problem of educational inequity. And until we have a new generation of leaders that's strong enough and skilled enough to actually solve this problem, it's not going to get solved. So how do you build a movement that addresses that? That was the thought that, that we sort of came up with. <coughs> I'm going to talk about what led me to start Teach for India by, by requesting you to do a short exercise with me right now. And I don't know, there must be about, and for argument's sake, I'm going to say 100 people in the room. Um, I want you all to just really quietly without making any noise. Just stand where you are, please. Okay. And now I want you to imagine that you're all three to four years old. That when you're three to four years old, what are you doing? What are you thinking about when you're a three-year-old? Playing. And what is your family thinking about? Where you're going to go to school, right? The million dollar question. So I'm going to request the first row and half of the second row to just sit. Again, three to four years old, I've asked these people to sit. This is the population of Indian kids. Why are these people sitting down? So they're the ones actually who will never step into a school, okay? So they want 4% of our country won't even go to a Balwadi or have access to any school, still, today. And now I want you to imagine your class 4, class 5, class 6 of primary school, and this whole half of the room, sit down please, as well as the first three rows. Imagine where our country would be. So 
So that's the big vision. One day, all children will attain an excellent education. Again, not just an education. An excellent education. And defining and thinking about what that actually means. That doesn't just mean sitting for your exams and doing well. It means are you set up to be happy, successful in your life? Are you prepared for life? And then at Teach for India, we said, actually, let's remove the one day and let's think about how we can solve this problem in a fellow's lifetime, in your lifetime, 50 years from now. If we had to give every child in India the opportunities that we gave to Farveen, how would we do that? How would we do that? Here's our humble attempt to answer the question. What we're saying is the way we can do that is to build a next generation of leaders that is truly committed and equipped to solving this problem. They're not all going to be teachers in classrooms, you see, because some of them will need to be politicians to change the way India looks for our kids. Some of them will need to be business leaders to channel resources into education. Some of them will need to be media leaders to talk about inequity in education. But can we create that generation of leaders that keeps this mission in their mind long term? Is this making sense? I'm going to give you an example of one of our 506 fellows. Um, so this is Srini Swaminathan. And he actually worked for eight years on oil rigs. He was an engineer, worked at a company called Schlumberg Aid, lived in different countries around the world, heard about Teach for India, and said, I'm moving back to India to become a teacher. Everyone in his family thought he was a little bit crazy, as do most of our parents. Um, so he moved to Mumbai. That's his actual picture from his oil rig, his life before Teach for India. Um, and here you see um, a picture of when we welcome our fellows in them holding the fifties, which is symbolic of a movement. So that's Srini. Just to give you a little bit of an insight into what happens in this two-year fellowship that we create for our fellows, um, the first thing that happens is all of our fellows go to Pune and they live together for five weeks at our Teach for India Training Institute. And we put them through very, very long days. We do not let them sleep um, when they're there. And we talk about what is inequity and why does it matter and where are our kids and what are the skills that you need to develop to put kids on a different life path, right? And I don't want any fellow to ever be in a position that I was in when I was 18 where we were literally asking each other, like, what did you do in school and trying to figure out what a curriculum was. No. Teaching is incredibly hard to do, and it takes a lot more than just passion to do it well. So Srini attended our, our um, training institute, and then he actually met his kids. And one of the first thing he did was his, his class was called the Responsible Champions class. So when you walk into uh, to Srini's class, they have chants, and they have songs, and they say, welcome, PD, to the Responsible Champions class. So, Right away from day one, these little second graders, they were literally this big, were thinking of themselves as responsible and thinking of themselves as champions. And I'm going to tell you a really quick story that I love about Srini's impact in his first week of teaching. In his first week, something in the school changed and the shifts changed. And so one of the little boys in his class, who'd been in his class for one week, was now transferred to the afternoon shift. And so he would no longer have Srini as a teacher. So he went home, little six-year-old, and he told his mom, I'm not going back to school. The mom said, why? And he said, because I want to be in Srini Baya's classroom. And she said, don't be silly. And the child refused to go back to school. So he said, you have to go and meet the HM and tell the HM to put me back into the morning shift so that I can be in Srini Baya's class. So the mother went to school. And it's hard for in these schools Parents are that it's not easy to meet the principal. So she went for six days in a row before the HM actually met her. And she said when she went in with this little boy and the HM was so taken aback, said, But what has this Srini Baya done in this week, you know, that makes this little child want to be in his class so much? And the little boy articulated that Srini Baya 
tells us that our English will be better than his. He's got a very strong Tamil accent. Shrini Bea dances in class. Shrini Bea wears an apron with words stuck on it. So like he becomes like a chef in the class. Srini Bea sings with us. Srini Bea tells us that whatever we dream, if we work hard enough, we will get there. Six-year-old child, in one week, his aspirations had changed, his commitment to himself had changed. This is the power of what can happen. In addition to the classroom, Srini just created all of these experiences for his kids and for Teach for India outside of the classroom. So just to name a few, he actually did a TEDx talk, but he got his kids onto stage. I think he really like argued with the organizers because it's not difficult that they allow more than one person on. But he got his kids on stage carrying kites that they had made, talking about what it means to be a responsible champion. <coughs> he also helped us organize one of the largest education conferences called Inspire Ed that Teach for India conducts every year. He's a serial marathon runner and raises money and awareness for Teach for India. Um, so it just gives you an idea of the flavor of the kind of fellows that we bring into the program. <coughs> Here you see um, on the bottom his end of year showcase. So one of the things that our fellows do is they get kids. When he took over his class, they couldn't speak a word. They couldn't read a three letter word. And what you see there are images from their end of year showcase where they staged a two hour performance completely in English for their families and their supporters. And you can imagine, we have families crying saying, I didn't know my son was capable of this. I didn't know my daughter had it in her to actually do this. So what are we trying to do? Again, it's not a movement just trying to put teachers into classrooms. We're saying in the two years, take your kids, if they're four years, five years, six years behind, put them on a different life path. But in the long term, become a movement of leaders that's going to solve the problem for all kids. So if you leave the fellowship thinking that the best way you can solve the problem is to go into corporate India and become the next Radha Tata who's going to like give as much as the Tatas have given, then do that. And if you believe that you can be the next editor of the Times of India and do a huge campaign that gets people into classrooms or resources into classrooms, then do that. Do whatever you can do to be the strongest leader you can be for India's children. One more example of impact, which I love to show. This is a first year fellow, Manu, and this is his child, Sahil. Uh, Sohail, sorry. Uh, same child, on the left when he started, and on the right, exactly one year later. Now, when you look at this, and those of you in the back can't, can't read it, but the first thing that stands out is just how the handwriting is improved, right? Their ability to write is just so much better, and that's much more than a year's worth of progress in a year. But the really incredible thing is to see the content of these two essays. The first one talks about cat, rat, mouse, something someone's told him, he's picked it up in some textbook. On the right, the title of his essay is The Day I Will Become a Superhero. Look at how the child's thinking has evolved his creativity, his imagination, his aspirations have changed, but also Manu knows as a fellow that it's not enough just to get kids to dream big, but he needs the actual skill of writing really well to be able to get there. And so long term, we represent what we're trying to do. We want to have thousands of Teach for India fellows graduate from the pro program and become alumni and go into this puzzle. The black pieces are pieces we don't even know yet, so we just mark them black, because Teach for India doesn't know how to solve this problem. Okay? But the interesting thing about this puzzle is that there is a piece, there are pieces in education, and there are many, many pieces outside of education, because we believe that solving educational equity is only going to happen with leaders across sectors, and the symbolism of the puzzle is they need to work together. I worked for 17 years on my own. I was only able to do 4,000 kids. But look at the exponential impact if we have thousands of alumni working together 
and getting their impact to feed off each other. That's really what we're attempting to do. And so four years from when we started Teach for India, where are we? Can you guess? 500 fellows, 16,000 students, five cities. Thanks. We just added two cities right now. So we're, we're, we're feeling very proud of that. They just completed their first month. So we're in Mumbai, Pune, Delhi, Chennai, and Hyderabad. Not yet in the east, but hopefully that's, that's the next step. Um, and then where do we want to go? And we have very ambitious plans, and I'm putting that out there to, to infuse the idea of you joining a movement in some way or the other. Um, but in five years, we want to be 2,000 fellows, transforming the lives of 60,000 kids. And perhaps even more importantly than that, if you think of that puzzle again, that's 3,000 alumni out there in those different puzzle pieces working together. And you can imagine the impact of that. I mean, I was in a, in a meeting with my team last week in Mumbai where we were just talking about the Mumbai City vision. And their vision is to have 500 alumni just in Mumbai itself. And you can imagine those alumni interacting and working with each other and actually getting to that, that solution city by city. And then we hope to move from the cities to the semi-urban areas to the rural areas. And just, just to sort of close before I share a few lessons, um, it's not, not a new idea. Um, the first idea uh, started 20 years ago in the US. It's a, it's a program called Teach for America in the US. And it's an absolutely phenomenal program. Today they have 8,000 fellows teaching um, in, in low resource classrooms across the US. Um, and they have a crazy percentage of um, graduates from Harvard Yale, Stanford, they're the number two largest recruiters of young people in the country um, apply to Teach for America. So you can see how it's really gained a lot of momentum. And today there are actually 24 countries and another 30 countries in discussion. And we're all part of a global network called Teach for All. So we're all learning from each other and understanding that this is actually a global problem that needs to be solved. So in India we talk about in 50 years every child in India attain an excellent education, but globally we're also looking at, you know, can the Aboriginal kids in Australia who face tremendous inequity, can they attain an excellent education, and can the refugees in Bosnia attain an excellent education? So it's a fascinating sort of global problem to understand. And finally, I just wanted to leave you with um, a couple of just quick Learnings. I tried to distill my now 21 years of doing this work. What, what have I actually learned? The first, and, and this is what I'm going to talk more about um, after dinner, but the importance of knowing why you're doing what you're doing. And I just want to leave you with that, that thought. Do we know why we're doing what we're doing? Not just the big part of our life, but the little thing. Why am I sitting here in this auditorium today? Why do I choose the friends that I choose? Why do I speak in the way that I do? Can I understand and own why? And do I think about that? And for me, an understanding of this and keeping this in the top of my mind has really changed the way that I have, I have tried to live my life. The second is just a quick story on giving. Um, and hopefully it'll, it'll give you a, a small part of the inspiration that it gives me. But this is one of my Akanksha students, his name was Lalit. Um, and you see him here starring in our Akanksha musical, which was the biggest, most challenging thing I've ever done in my career, was put 200 kids on stage in this really beautiful musical that we worked on together. And Lalit was the star of the musical. But Latif came into Akansha when he was 12 years old and he was one of those rare people that walks into a room and just makes it better. I don't know, any know people like that. But just people who have so much warmth and so much energy that you just want to be around them. And Latif was one of those kids. And as teachers, they would always tell us, don't have favorites. But Latif was always one of my favorites. It was really hard not to adore this kid. And he was good at everything. 
He was great at studies. He was an athlete. He sang beautifully. He danced beautifully. He was just an incredible kid. And we had the privilege of having him at Akanksha for many years. And then when he was 21, I was driving a few few years ago um, from Bombay to Pune. And as I reached Pune, I got a call from one of my teachers. She was really worked up and upset. And she said, Shine, um, Latif is in the ICU. He'd never been sick before. And I turned my car around and I drove back to Bombay. And by the time I reached back to Bombay, Latif had passed away. And the next day, I was in the community in his house. And Latif lived in a 10 foot by 10 foot home, didn't have a father adored his grandfather and his biggest dream had been to earn enough money so that his grandfather could stop working. His grandfather was about 75 years old. And six months before Latif passed away, he was working nights, he was in college, he was rehearsing for the musical, he was doing all of this and his grandfather had actually stopped working and that was a big moment in Latif's life. So I was sitting with his grandfather the day after he passed away and his grandfather said, Didi, he said, you know, I knew that Latif was really sick. And I told him, I said, Latif, this isn't like an ordinary illness. You're really sick. And so I took out 14,000 rupees that I had saved up over months from a trunk. And I put it into Latif's hand. And I told him, I said, Latif, take this money and promise me that you will go to a private hospital and that you will not go to a government hospital. And Latif, because he didn't want his grandfather to go back to work, took that money, put it back in the trunk, went to a government hospital, died 12 hours later. And I don't know if the outcome would have been any different if he'd gone to a different hospital, if 14,000 rupees even would have brought him into another hospital. But I do know that that was the day that I actively started trying to understand what it means to give. I'm really pushing myself to understand this infinite ability that we have as human beings to be able to put someone else before us and to truly give. And Latif, I think about him all the time because to me, he's such a symbol of our ability and our capacity to really be able to give. So that's been my second like, big, big lesson over the year. The third is just a really simple one, but I think sometimes we look for big answers, at least I did. For many years of my life, I was looking for that one solution that would change the world. And there's no solution, I think, now that will change the world. But at the same time, the little things, things that you and I can do a hundred of every single day, imagine the collective addition of all of that goodness. I was talking to one of your professors a little bit earlier today, and I was saying, you know, it's sad that in today's world, it's become easier to be bad than it has been to be good. How do we flip that? How do we make it easy to be good? Yeah. Because we know, and we may see children, you give children an opportunity to be good, they get so excited. Like, people like to be good. Being good feels good. And yet there are so many pressures on us. Can we just simplify everything? Can we start not trying to solve the big things, but just say, how am I with the person who I'm with right now? Those little acts of kindness, can I do them? And I've seen the incredible spiral and ripple effect of those little, little acts of goodness. <clears throat> Look in the mirror. I mean, we call this many different things, right? We can't even be the change, which, which we use and is reused and reused. But the idea here is really that when we have a problem, we always have a choice. The way I like to think about it, we can either pick up a mirror or we can pick up a magnifying glass. When we pick up a magnifying glass, what happens to the problem? It becomes bigger and it's external to us, right? It's like if my class isn't going well as a teacher, I say, well, the parents don't care or the kids aren't coming regularly. The minute I pick up the mirror, the whole equation changes, right? Because now where's the problem? In me. And so I need to ask, what will I do about it? Irrespective of whether I've created the problem or not, really doesn't matter. If it upsets me, it's my problem. And the only thing I can change 
or attempt to change is myself. That's been a really, really, really important um, learning for me. And so I'm going to stop there. Um, and I'd love, I'd love to take questions on anything at all. Um, it's not a lot of time to talk about 21 years, but I hope it, it gave you a, a little bit of a flavor. Um, and I think, you know, just, just before I open it up, um, what I would love from every single one of you is some commitment to build this movement in some way, you know? And I think at the greatest level, it's really thinking about doing the fellowship and the profound changes that you can find in yourself as a fellow after you graduate. But at the really easy level, it's spreading an awareness it's finding the right people to apply to the program. It's doing your own little bit. And I think, again, going back to the why, if you believe that this is important to integrate into your life in whatever way, and I believe there's a program on campus where some of you like teach um, the mess workers, and, and there's hundreds of opportunities you can find if you're interested. But just connecting with that question of like, is this important to me? Is it important? about it 20 years ago it was sort of a nice nice to do thing to be nice in today's world with the kinds of problems we face it's sort of an essential to do thing I mean if we want this world to be better for our kids and our children's children there's sort of an imperative to get engaged and involved with something so this is just one one platform to get involved with but we need a huge amount of support if we're to spread this across the country and really reach that goal in 50 years from now. Questions? Yeah. Uh, my name is Nishant. I'm a PGP 12 student. Uh, there are several questions, but I would like to start with one. Uh, before asking the question, I have a small doubt. Uh, when you have gone to, you said that you have uh, gone to the slum children. Is there a, an instance where you have gone to some village nearby Mumbai or Delhi or any place that you are working in, and uh, there are parents who have refused to send the children to their schools because they want them to work in a manual labor or something? So, if they are there, the, my question is. Especially uh, this is related to girls' children because I have experienced it while working in one NGO. Uh, how did you convince the parents to send their children to school? It is, is it uh, because you are a female? Because means because they see females as mothers or sisters. Uh, is it has it become easier for you to convince children? Sorry, parents to send their children or yeah. and how do you? Uh, give an insight on how should I be able to convince parents on this issue? Yeah, such a great question. I mean, when I when I started, I, I didn't speak a word of Hindi. I had an even stranger accent than I have today. Nobody took me seriously in the community. So it was very, very difficult. And I think the first response was, so many people like you have come and gone, and nothing's really happened. No one's been here consistently. So it was difficult. And I think what... What really helps is just that perseverance, you know? You just keep trying. And, and if this family says no, you take these two families next door, and then you find a way for these kids to talk to those kids, these parents to talk to those parents, involving the parents as partners, bringing the parents in. But the main thing is like your dedication and consistency to going. I just decided that whether five kids come in the beginning, or 50 kids come in the beginning, I'm just going to stop. And I'm going to believe in it, I'm going to keep going with it, I'm going to keep getting better, keep learning. Um, so I think that's what's made a difference. Overall, I found that we're not yet working in rural India, the situation could be a lot more difficult over there. But at least in the urban cities where we're working in the slum areas, there's a huge belief in education with parents. There's also at the same time a lot of pressure to work, especially with the older kids. And many of our kids have to balance that pressure with coming to school. But if they know they're getting something really meaningful from school, they will go through huge odds 
to actually come to school. And after dinner, I'm actually going to show a short video of one of my kids that is just an amazing story. But in that particular community, um, the homes all got demolished. And the kids were relocated an hour and a half away. And the teacher was really like, now, will the kids commute three hours a day to keep coming back to my classroom? But the kids did. She didn't lose a single child because they saw the value and the power of what she was doing. So I think concentrate on the quality of what you're doing, and people will over time see the result. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, I'm Sharman, a first year student. Firstly, I'd like to appreciate you, acknowledge you for building up an institution like this, creating a revolution in the field of education, and actually, you know, causing a revolution amidst today's youth to actually contribute to the field of education. So on that note, my question is, when uh, you have volunteers, you have um, your bhaiyas and didis coming up to teach, how do you actually instill that determination, that focus to actually contribute, to stay there, to yes, teach for the, those underprivileged yeah. students? Yeah. Um, because not everybody comes leaving a slum burger. Not everybody yeah. is a Srini Swami Swaminathan. Yeah. So how do you like keep that? Yeah, yeah. So that's a great question. So let, let me just talk you through the process a little bit so you understand. <coughs> First thing is, the program obviously is not for everybody, right? So we go out and we talk to thousands and thousands of young people because we believe that in this room, possibly 10% of you are thinking, this may be something interesting. Possibly 5% of you are actually a good fit with the program, right? So it's not for everybody. So the first part is that our, our bar is very selective and our selection is different from, from most selections. We look at both the things that you would normally expect, leadership, academics, etc. But much more importantly, in some ways, we look for soft skills, so your ability to influence, your respect and humility, your belief in the mission, your ability to persevere in difficult circumstances. So the first part of the answer is we're very selective. So this year, out of the nearly 8,000 applications we got to the program, we only selected 4% of people. So that's to give you a sense of of the fact not to put anyone off applying to the program because you should most definitely apply to the program. But it is selective, so we're looking for a type of person. The second is that it's really in some ways like an alternative MBA for the two years. So I just spoke about the initial training, but through the two years, there's ongoing trainings, leadership forums. You have a coach, a one-on-one -on -one coach for the two years. There's support groups, so a lot of the learning and pushing and motivation comes from other fellows. Because imagine sitting in a room like with three times the number of people as this room, but people all focused on like how we solve this problem. Like the kind of energy that comes from that revolution is one that sustains you. So on the days when you're ready to give up, there's someone there to pull you back up. So it's, it's a combination of like learning, teaching, and then the real motivation starts to come from the changes you see with your kids. And like we already in our fourth year now have kids who are at grade level. They're performing at the same level as kids in high income private schools. And that's just dramatically going to change their lives. And the motivation that comes from there is very special. To add to that, um, to add to that um, you have Yes, uh, agreed, you have a lot of selection criteria. But then when your aim is to achieve like greater heights in this field, don't you need volunteer, don't you need a lot of the youth coming up, joining your institution? And when we see around us, everybody's running the corp like the race for corporate success. <laughs> yeah, a lot of them, a lot of them. So uh, don't you think like incentives um, can be provided or tie-ups with government can be very beneficial? in like, you know, providing a very attractive kind of a picture being a part of Teach for yeah. India. So, I mean, I, I'm only going to give my own example because I think uh, the vast majority of people in this in this room are, probably have aspirations of going into corporate India. And, and I had that opportunity myself. So my dad was a banker. He spent 40 years with Citibank. We lived around the world. 
every one of the kids in my generation of my parents' friends ended up either going into investment banking or some form of like the financial sector. And I sort of see my journey 20 years down the line and I see their journey. And I really believe that today's world doesn't need people going the same way as everybody else. We need innovation, we need creativity, we need a different type of challenge, we need an ability to take risks. And one of the first things I did when I started Teach for India is I went and I met 20, 30 CEOs of companies. And I said, honestly, like, is this gonna make a difference? Like, are you gonna value this kind of experience? You know, the selection bar is high, they're gonna be, we're gonna put them through a grueling experience for two years. It's really like, we say, are you ready for a challenge? We really mean it. It's the hardest thing you'll ever do. And all of the CEOs were like, you know, today, we don't need people who just amass knowledge. We need the people who are willing to have the courage to be different, to stand away from the crowd, who understand what loyalty is, who are ready to do this for a marathon, not just for a sprint, you know? And I think it's not for everybody, but it's for those kind of people that want at the end of their lives to have been really, really successful, but in multiple ways, right? I can want to be successful and equate my success just with how much money I earn, or I can say I equate my success with leading a comfortable life, but what impact have I left on the world? And I think that's a question that each person here is probably battling with, but an important question to ask and to answer for yourself, and not what do the people around you think or what does your family think, but in those moments when you're sitting in a dark room by yourself, looking inside you, what do you want for yourself? And I think if you follow that, you're not going to go wrong. You will be successful. I mean, I've had the kind of opportunities that I never would have had if I had gone through a, a traditional corporate route today. Never. The kind of people I've met, the exposure, the responsibility, the happiness, the joy, the inspiration, I never would have had that. But I followed my heart. For somebody else, their journey is very different. My name is Ganesh. My name is Ganesh, and I'm a first year student here. What I want to know is, you know, whether it's an organization for profit or a not-for-profit organization, how do you manage the fundraising? You know, you need a uh, no, should, yeah, not you need a fund to run the organization, and you, even if you have volunteers, even they need to pay pay the minimum amount, you know, yeah. ensure that they give in their best. Yeah. So how do you ensure that you know this uh, funds come from various places and how uh, it does not break and keeps coming? Yeah. That's a very difficult thing, I believe. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm. That's a great point. I mean, firstly, it's not a volunteer program, so they are actually paid fellows, so there's a huge cost attached to that. And with our goal of 2,000 fellows, we're looking at an annual budget of about 100 crores a year, so that's the kind of revenue that we need to generate. Right now, it's purely non-profit, and it's all donations, and luckily, we have a broad-based um, base of donors. But I think we're thinking much more creatively, and actually we're talking to some IM students here as well about like, can we begin to think creatively about revenue generating models to make the sustainability of the program more, including looking at partnering with government. So, <coughs> continues to be like probably one of our top three challenges. And does the government genuinely support as in, you know, properly allow these to blow up funds? As of now? So as of now, we've not got government funding for our program because we're still negotiating with governments on placements. Um, I don't know how many of you are aware, but under the right to education, um, having a teacher qualification has become even more of an imperative. And our fellows, even if, like if you joined as a fellow, you're obviously highly qualified, but you don't have a B.Ed. or a D.Ed. degree, which is the requisite. Uh, so governments have been really open about partnering and allowing our fellows into classrooms as full-time teachers. And I think the next step is to figure out a way to formalize that and then to work on the funding. Thank you. So I'm uh, Andrew Witt. Uh, I believe uh, the quality of education in government schools is uh, affected by the high dropout rates. And these dropouts are mostly because of uh, heavy migration in the slums and uh, lack of awareness and even because of because the uh, parents of these children have very low aspirational values for the kids. I just want to know how TFI is addressing these issues you know, in improving the, the quality of education. So I think 
I think sometimes from the outside, those seem like the issues. From the inside, I, I would actually um, disagree with, with some of your analysis for dropout. Um, I think that right now, the quality of schooling is so poor that I actually wonder how even 10% of kids stay in school, honestly. Because they come to school and like 30, 40, 50% of the time, there isn't even physically a teacher present in the classroom. And if anything, it's just complete rote learning. You write on the board, the kids copy it down. So I think the way to solve the problem is not to try to solve all the social problems around it, but actually to strengthen the value proposition within the school. And what I've seen is when teachers have been strong, and been strong partners with parents, parents will go through great odds to keep their kids in school. And a parent wants great things for their child. Over time, seeing the education system, they begin to lose hope, which is where the perception is that perhaps they have less aspirations for their kids as our parents have for us. But it's actually not true. The minute you give them that glimmer of a teacher who believes in your child and can do something with your child, and they see their child start to achieve, their aspirations shoot right back up. So I, I'm a big believer that to solve the problem in the country, it's really at the core of it is a great teacher. And all of the other stuff helps. You know, you have a great curriculum, great infrastructure, it all helps. But frankly, with a weak teacher and all of that, the quality of education is terrible. And with a strong teacher, you put them under a tree and give them nothing else, and they're going to figure out what to do for their kids. So we just need to change the kind of people that go into teaching and the kind of training and support that we provide to our teachers. Hello, ma'am. I first of all would like to appreciate you for the great movement which you have started. My question is, as of now, you have, we have tie-ups with the, all the schools, both private and public, wherein we provide quality education. But there is 5% of the population who doesn't even have access to school. They don't even come to school. Are there, are there any steps which you are taking in this regard? So we are not actively addressing it except for in our actual schools. So if in our communities, when our fellows spend a lot of time in the community, they see out of school children, they're encouraging them to enroll in the school. So that is happening. I have one fellow specifically who's working now with homeless kids and he's managed to integrate about 300 of them into schools. So fellows are doing that. But I think the reason we're focusing on it, on it less is because that is actually a big area of focus for the government. And the government's actually done a really good job over the last decade in providing access. Unfortunately, at the cost of quality. So, you know, ideally they would have focused on both. So the problem is now kids have access to school, but they're dropping out of school because the quality is so. So, so in our thinking, the much bigger issue to address right now is quality. And if we're able to do that, I think the access will catch up. And then also, some of the access problems come from extremely remote areas, tribal areas, where kids still don't have access to a school. And that's not something right now that te the Teacher India Fellowship, at least, is equipped to deal with. Thank you. We'll have the last two questions, and we can have the uh, uh, sure. later. Sure. Good evening, ma'am. I am Chandra Shekhar from PGP 12. Uh, thing is, what I feel uh, about the education system is we need to have a curriculum with difference so that the kids actually stick on the system. Yeah. What uh, that difference Teach for India has in its place so that the slum kids also come back to you for the education? That's the question number one. And in one of the slides, you mentioned that it's a globally connected community. What inspirations did you get from other countries, or how did we inspire the other countries to go about in this program? and uh, any learnings which you learn from that. Great, great. So in terms of the curriculum, what we've done is we've given our fellows actually a huge amount of freedom to respond to their kids and their communities and their needs so that the curriculum is relevant. So what we do is we train our fellows, we give them very clearly defined standards that the kids need to achieve at the end of the year. So at the end of class three, a class three kid in a rich private school is achieving this, and that's the size of the gap. But then the resources you use, the materials you choose, we give them lots and lots of examples and lots of resources, but it's up to the fellow to really customize that to their kids and their classroom. So it ends up being a really organic curriculum. 
um, that's really relevant to the kids and their lives. And of course, we are learning a lot because getting a curriculum right is a very, very difficult thing to do. And fellows are collaborating a lot across classrooms um, on curriculum ideas. Um, in terms of the network, I'll talk a little bit about what India has given to the network because it's actually really exciting. We've only been here for four years, um, but we're dramatically changing the way that some of the other countries um, are working. And I think one is our very big focus on the community. So fellows spend a lot of their time in the communities with the parents, the, getting the parents involved as partners, spending time in the community, dealing with all of the other issues that are belongs to learning. And that's something that a lot of the other countries are immersing themselves with. And one other uh, example I'll give, there's a big focus in Teach for India on the development of a fellow not just as a leader, but their own personal development as a human being. So one of the first questions we ask our fellows is, at the end of your life, who do you want to be? Not what do you want to be. Who do you want to be? What kind of a person? And can you use the two years to really work on your own, discover your greatest strengths, your greatest challenges, and who you are? And that work around the self is also spreading into other countries a lot. And whereas in network, we're talking a lot about how we can really accelerate each young person's development. Hello, ma'am. I'm Rahul, second year student. I'm, uh, as uh, we can see, the quality and our focus is uh, very good uh, uh, for the thing what Teach for India is providing. And we also talked about the different uh, helping the students uh, dream big. But ma'am, uh, don't you think, uh, as in, uh, if some of the guy is able to uh, attend till class 2 at 12th, very good education, and then suddenly he gets to some engineering college. So how do you let that person actually achieve that engineering degree? Because then, because he's poor, he'll have to have fun to fund his uh, engineering or medical, whatever it is. So how do you uh, help him complete his dream? Because his aspirations are super strong now. Yeah. If he's not getting funding now, he'll get very tense in life, as in, I had everything else good, but I didn't get engineering. So, yeah. how do you tackle such problems? Yeah, so I mean, we're obviously still at a stage where we're hoping for that problem to arise because we need to get all our kids to that level, and that'll be such a big achievement itself. But what we're doing right now, and Teach for India is still a few years away from graduation, so we don't have that problem yet. But at our Kamsha, we've actually set up a fund exactly for that reason. So, all of our alumni are eligible for the, for the money to go on to higher studies um, in whatever they, they actually want to be able to do. Um, and we're hoping to just build that more and more because we really don't want kids to be in a position where they work so hard to get there and as you said, they're not able to take that next step. Uh, we have, if any questions we have in the second round, we have Thank you so much, and, and I'm around till early tomorrow morning, so I stay awake late, so even if informally after the session, any of you want to catch up and talk, I'm more than happy to spend time. I'd love to spend informal time with you. Thank you so much. I'm sure we need a few of the girls to indicate how tired we are. Oh yeah, I didn't have <laughs> Uh, Ma'am, that was indeed a very thought-provoking yet of fun interaction with you. I was great to know more about you and your work. Uh, your energy and pride is definitely going to inspire most of us to work towards such social causes. With this, we come to an end of the first interaction with Ms. Shaheen, and we look forward to the next interaction later today. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks a lot, Ma'am. And participants, thank you for being a wonderful audience today. Yeah, thank you. Please stay back as the guest is escorted out of the auditorium.